It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome our second uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalist of the day to this event. I say Silicon Valley venture capitalist, but he's also one of the most successful serial entrepreneurs the, that we've had, especially in a number of life science companies that he's invested in and founded. Uh, he's more recently been a partner with Alloy Ventures, and more recent than that, currently focused on launching, uh, founding and launching an uh, online gaming company that he's about to tell you about, uh, Seriosity. And besides for that, best of all, he's a Rice alum. Please give another Texas welcome uh, today to our keynote speaker, Leighton Reed. Great. Thanks, Brad. Gee, it's great to be back at another Rice Forum. This is a great program. I really enjoyed uh, the last one in life science. Uh, I'm sure a few of you come to both of these. It's, uh, it's, it's fun to um, have a chance to uh, engage across the, the spectrum of things that Rice is doing and that entrepreneurs are doing. A little louder? Okay. All right. So um, today we're going to be talking about how Web 2.0 is going to shape and create the future of work. 2.0. And uh, these ideas are based on hundreds of conversations with people that work in large enterprises, especially, with hundreds of hours of video and observation of elite level gamers. And so we're going to talk about a special kind of convergence there. But first, we want to meet Ted. Ted graduated from a great university like this one. He has a fancy MBA. He works for a well respected company, and he doesn't exactly hate his job, but lots of what he has to do is dull and repetitive. And even when he's at the top of his game, a lot of his best work is frustrated by confusing objectives, by intermittent feedback, by information overload. Uh, there's just stuff about his job that um, is not getting the best out of Ted. But there's another part of Ted's life. He's also an elite level gamer in a multiplayer online game <laughs> called World of Warcraft. This is, this is game Ted, hair on fire, totally engaged. He knows exactly what needs to be done. He's working with tools that have been customized for his use, and he is fully engaged. The tools that WorkTed has in front of him look a little bit like this. Uh, it used to be called Enterprise Software. It's mail and project management, um, reports, video chat. That's kind of like the latest, greatest thing. There's some IM in there, and of course there's PowerPoint. But GamerTed is looking at screens like these. M far more engaging, colorful, lively, and uh, it may look like information overload to you, but each of the elements on these screens has been carefully um, chosen by Ted and his guildmates in order to have <clears throat> just the right information at just the right time available when he needs it, especially when things are happening very quickly at a high, high pace. So we're talking about this convergence, and I'm going to give you seven reasons why we think this is going to happen. We'll say a little bit about seriosity, but this talk is mostly about ideas. It started with a couple of pool dads standing around the pool. My daughter and Byron Reeves, a professor at Stanford, were both swimmers in, uh, five years ago. And there's a lot of time standing around on the pool deck waiting for that one minute out of every hour that your daughter swims. Some, I see some people nodding here. Um, Byron Reeves is, is kind of a stud in the field of media psychology. He's, he's trained in psychology. He's in the Department of Communications. He is an expert on what's going on inside your brain when you are exposed to media or maybe when um, uh, media is managing you, especially interactive stuff. And we com started comparing notes on our mutual interests here. Uh, five years ago, it led to the founding of uh, a startup called Seriosity that we're still um, excited about, but still looking to find right the, the best way to turn that into a big success. It led to a Harvard Business Review article that uh, was about our work with IBM on leadership and what can be learned from these games. And then most recently, this book. When you said you had a prop, Brad, I was expecting you to hold up our book. But that's OK. You can get it. He must have it on Kindle. It's only 10 bucks on Kindle. Yeah, yeah. It's 20 bucks, 20 bucks uh, if you want it. But you don't have to read the book, because I'm going to tell you everything that's in it right now. So. <laughs> now, what is a doctor who turned venture capitalist, biotech entrepreneur doing talking about games here? Well, it goes back to 1982 when I was interested in decision theory, economics, and medicine, computer-aided support of decisions for doctors when I was at the Harvard School of Public Health. And it seemed to me it would be a lot easier for computers to help patients than doctors because presumably the level of expertise were different. And I went to every bookstore in Cambridge, Mass. with a tape measure and measured how many feet of bookshelf space were devoted to different health topics. And guess what? It was diet and exercise. 
So I decided to marshal the very best information we could put together at Harvard about what, what is it about the distal goals that, that can promote behavior change on these hard kind of health things. What are the psychological tools? What are the, what's the information people need? What do we want them focused on? Is it the scales or planning their meals and whatever? So we, we packaged all this up in the original Boston computer diet. If you say the acronym quickly, it sounds like obesity. And this was 1985, simulated nutrition counselors. This was a merger of ELISA, a text-based adventure game, a MUD, uh, and a Skinner box, all in the era when the IBM PC had two floppy disks. Apple had not launched the Macintosh yet. It was the Apple IIe, and yes, it worked on the Commodore 64. And this was a moderately successful product. When I went to look for where is the literature on the psychology of why video games are a powerful uh, source of engagement, almost the only papers, or two or three papers, by a guy named Tom Malone, a Rice graduate, who was at the time at Xerox Park. He's now a professor at MIT, and has written a wonderful book called The Future of Work that has influenced our thinking a lot. All right, what's reason number one why we think multiplayer online games and these ideas are gonna have a huge impact in work? And the first is that these are very, very big, and they represent a huge part of what's going on in media, and culture, and whenever that happens, it bleeds into the workplace. So first of all, we've got uh, a little over 12 million people in World of Warcraft, uh, over a million in the last month experiencing Second Life. If you add in some of the more casual games like Neopets and Habbo Hotel and QQ in China, we're talking about half a billion people playing these games. Many of the titles have players that are in their 30s. It's not just teenage boys, and the gender balance is more and more balanced. It's about uh, two or three to one in, in some of the bigger titles. $50 billion industry, the launch of a new hot video game dwarfs the biggest launches of a book like Harry Potter, a movie like The Dark Knight, over $300 million launch just a couple of weeks ago for the latest one. People are spending so much time in these games, it's robbing from television. In general, games are responsible for about 10 hours less TV a week. Uh, Facebook is now a dominant platform in games challenging the Xbox and, and the Wii. Uh, there's so many pe people playing games on Facebook now, it is one of the most important activities or most uh, time-consuming activities on Facebook because it's sticky. People keep coming back. There's a game called Farmville where you get to raise little... How many people here have a farm? Fess up. <laughs> okay. All, all my soybeans wilted. But, I, uh, but this, this is kind of a fun game. It's it's really, really simple game, but there's something engaging about it. We'll talk to you about what the ingredients are. 69 million people played that game in the last month, and that's just one game on Facebook. So the second reason we think the world of games is going to influence work is that there's a new generation coming. There's a new kid in town, right? Uh, the millennials, generation Y, these are, these are ambitious, optimistic, multitasking team players. They don't want to be measured by an odometer. They want to be measured by a speedometer. For them, work isn't a place you go, it's a thing you do. And they bring these expectations into the workplace. Competition is fun and familiar. Risk is part of the game. Trial and error is how you play the game. Um, it, it's a different, and companies, that say, grow up kids, welcome to our world, are not gonna compete successfully against the companies that embrace these sensibilities and find ways to make them part of their culture and part of their success. Um, it's, as I said, it's not just kids. We did a project for IBM uh, a few years ago where we surveyed elite level gamers who are IBM employees. And yes, there were quite a few of them. And, and we found some surprising things. There, there was a a very clear sense of recognition by the elite players in this very conservative company that there were parallels and that there was also transferability of ideas and skills that were learned in the games into their working world. Reason number three, play is not the opposite of work. Mayor Bloomberg um, was um, um, caught an employee playing solitaire on his computer a couple of years ago, it was reported in the New York Times in 2006, and he said that's just not an appropriate thing for someone to do at work, and maybe that person wasn't uh, getting their job done or not, but it really sort of uh, enhances or, or it makes, makes stark here this kind of uh, outdated Puritan ethic. If you really examine the, the, the literature and, the, and the, the, uh, the psychology and the philosophy of play, you see that play and work are hopelessly intertwined in human performance. Perhaps the most accessible work on this is from this guy with the almost unpronounceable last name. His name is, is Sink, since Mihaly, 
And he is a Hungarian-born psychologist that has written beautiful work about what's going on in the mind of a neurosurgeon or a mountain climber or anyone else who is at the top of their game, who is facing a very hard set of challenges and has exactly the skills needed to tackle those challenges. It is a state of flow. Ego disappears. Time disappears. It's when we're at our very, very best. Well, over and over, you can, it's easy to understand that this is the kind of thing we see in very absorbing, very effective, good, great games. And it happens all too little in work. Um, reason number four, engagement is in short supply. There's a whole, uh, uh, there are a bunch of vendors that, that go out and measure engagement and publish reports and try and help companies figure out how to increase engagement. Engaged employees are people that work with passion. They feel a strong connection to their job. They're much more likely to believe they can impact things like customer satisfaction and you know, there's self-efficacy there. But they're only 30% of the workforce. And interestingly, these are not the people that tend to respond to the usual pay for performance kind of incentives. These are people, and we, and we know even other people, we can create engagement by helping people see that they have autonomy in their jobs, that there is a road towards mastery at whatever they're doing, and that they feel like they have a sense of purpose. And of course, uh, it's so important now that even, even Scott Adams has decided to start parroting it with, uh, well, that's the middle panel. I didn't want to violate his copyright by showing you the whole cartoon. You'll have to get it off the website. Let's meet Jen. Jen is a call center operator who walked across the street for a 50 cent raise and was surprised when the hiring manager said, Jen, we don't need your resume. Just sit down and start playing the game. If you get to level four, we'll start paying you. If you get to level 10, we'll let you start talking to interacting in the game with real customers and not just sim simulated customers and trainers and that sort of thing. So um, these are, uh, this is a cartoon here, but it's, um, it is a very, doable thing. We know people working on this uh, category of jobs that are just too easy to do well. It's too repetitive. And yet it requires a lot of tacit knowledge to be able to deliver a customer experience. These, these are a very interesting kind of hard job. And there's no vector of uh, advancement. Jen's job five years from now is going to look just like it does today. Well, games do a fantastic job of figuring out that that doesn't work for people for very long. You have to give people a vector of accomplishment. Games do a great job of that. So in the game that we see Jen playing, she's going to be leveling up, having more responsibility, being more of a trainer, and, and being assigned or given the opportunity to volunteer for more and more difficult tasks. Um, by the way, this is going to be aided by technology. Maybe one of the companies here is going to figure out how to use voice stress analysis and voice recognition in order to provide the kind of real-time feedback that Jen needs to be able to play this game with the same kind of uh, high-level feedback that great games deliver. I'm going to skip a couple of these. Okay, reason number five. This isn't just art. It's not just movie making. There's a, there's a recipe for great games, or if there's not a recipe, at least there's an ingredient list, and that much is knowable. So we can start with the things that we know that great, game, great games do very well. Self-representation through an avatar, a mini-me, represented in the game. People get very invested in these things if you give them a chance to customize them a little bit, and they behave around this avatar in surprisingly realistic ways uh, about how they, how they behave. Avatars, uh, people who stand far apart from each other in the elevator tend to move their avatars with the same kind of social distancing that, that they do uh, in, in their physical life. It, it, it is really interesting. Uh, ranks, levels, narrative, feedback. Um, you know, we, uh, we could, this is a whole talk by itself, so we're not going to spend too much time on this list. But um, believe me, these things are knowable, and, th and they can be copied, and you're just going to find them in successful games over and over. The question is, why don't we see more of this in the workplace? There's a lot of great books about how companies need to have an epic story. Good to great comes to mind, for example. Um, but most, most, for most employees, shareholder value isn't the epic story that may, causes them to be eager to get to work in the morning. And uh, so there's, a, there's lessons that can be learned here that are kind of softer lessons as opposed to just installing uh, work inside a game, which we think is also part of what could happen here. By the way, this is a good point to point out uh, how we think about the difference between virtual environments like Second Life and the, the full, uh, full up game as in World of Warcraft. So Second Life and other virtual worlds do a fabulous job of creating uh, that experience of self-representation through an avatar, exploring a very engaging, interesting 3D environment in which there may be uh, really interesting creative uses of marketplaces and economies 
for tying together different kinds of rewards and, and things that, that make it engaging. Um, so that's, that's one side of the picture. But then when you add in this vector of accomplishment with rules and goals and feedback and teams, you get a whole other level of engagement. And that's what we see in the MMOs or multiplayer online games. Let me give you one example. Ross Smith is a really innovative guy. He works in a department that you wouldn't expect much of that. It's Windows Test at Microsoft. But as, when, as uh, Microsoft was approaching the launch of Windows 7, they had a mammoth task to quality control the thousands and thousands of pages of documentation and instructions and presentations that were embodied in that for launch all around the world. And Ross has been pioneering the use of games to get people to volunteer to do stuff above and beyond their job because it's satisfying in order to make progress in the game. So he created a game with leader boys, boards and point systems and feet feedback and the kind of things we've been talking about, which attracted over almost 5,000 Microsoft employees to do something above and beyond their job and use their language skills to help make sure that the pages of Windows 7 were correct in uh, over 100 different languages. Uh, total screens reviewed, almost half a million screens. One guy got really went wild in the game. He, he was the winner, over uh, almost 10,000 uh, points, almost 10,000 screens reviewed. Uh, it's just an example of how some simple game mechanics uh, can, used properly, uh, change behavior. Next time you're checking out at Target, uh, lean over and take a look at the screen that the checkout person is using. Um, most Targets have this interesting little thing. That, uh, down below the G, there's a little string of things that look like um, uh, DNA on the screen, G, R, G, G, G. This represents item by item during checkout, whether the time spent scanning that item and getting it in the bag was above or beyond or, or within the norms that Target has established for each item. So for toothpaste and, and things in little boxes that are easy to scan, um, they're expected to move those quickly. For clothes that have to be taken off the hanger and folded up, they get a little more time. Well, these, these, uh, this, this feedback is literally bing, bing, uh, item by item feedback, just like Pac-Man, remember, bing, 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 bing. So feedback in all time scales, by the way, is a very relevant piece of these games. So uh, the feedback is, is uh, uh, with letters, with numbers, with words, and of course their supervisors looking at this stuff. Um, this could be overdone too, but we have uh, heard uh, target employees say, you know, this makes a job that's otherwise really repetitive more like a game. What it tells you is that target really cares about checkout time. And so uh, if the employee doesn't, this could be another form of dreadful industrial engineering, uh, you know, early 19th century assembly line drudgery. If the employee buys into the idea that, you know what, we, we're doing a great job for our customers by getting them out of here quickly, they'll come back sooner and I, you know, I can continue to be employed, then perhaps the whole thing works. Um, Seriosity built a, a synthetic currency that can be used by enterprises. It's another example of just taking a single element from a game and then using it as a starting point in the enterprise. This is, a, this is play money that, that has uh, properties built into it that make it kind of enterprise grade in terms of the way we think about managing the economy. What can you do with it? Well, you can send it to people with your email to indicate the importance that you place on that email. And people can send it back to you saying, thanks, I, I really wanted that, or they can keep it, which is kind of a signal that it wasn't that important to them. Uh, a currency circulating and a flywheel uh, like that could turn out to be very useful for allocating resources, scarce corporate resources in all kinds of settings. Uh, and we, we created leaderboards as well as using some of these lighter elements in the, in the corporate setting. So there's another reason, a, a sixth reason why this is going to invade the enterprise, and that is that there really is a science that supports this. Again, it's not just a bunch of uh, kids in black T-shirts um, um, doing some kind of black art that turns out to uh, sometimes do this and sometimes do that. Uh, this is really measurable. Um, this, for example, the same task in a first-person shooter game in which you're shooting, shooting a, a computer-generated character um, is, generates more arousal when it happens in the context of a story when you know why that's the bad guy and why you want to shoot him and why you want to survive and that sort of thing. It generates more arousal than in a game without that same story. Uh, how do they know? They measure arousal with uh, skin conductance, the, the saltiness on the sweat on the palms of your hands, heart rate. Uh, uh, they uh, are now using fMRI. They're using uh, uh, you know, parts of the brain lighting up, and they're finding extraordinary parallels between the parts of the brain that light up when you're engaged in certain kind of interpersonal behavior in games and when you're doing it in real life. We didn't evolve to know the difference 
between mediated images and mediated social interactions and the real thing. So these tools are powerful. Reason number seven is that gamers already do work. This is one of the uh, really fun things we did very early in Seriosity. We hired Stanford elite level gamers, gave them a job, and of course the first thing they do is they write home to mom and dad and said, guess what I'm getting paid to do? <laughs> and um, and we, first we sent them on a quest to go find taxonomies of work. So go learn about work, kids. You're college students and gamers. What, is, what does the world of work look like? And so, um, we, you know, we spent a few weeks looking at all these different taxonomies and ended up with one that uh, the, the Bureau uh, Department of Labor uses for various things. It's, a, it's meant to be a collectively exhaustive, um, um, uh, mutually exclusive collection of all the different things people do in their work. And, of course, for most of us, our job is made up of many tasks. But there are many people whose job is their task. Uh, just hold that thought. But as you just sort of scroll through this list of, of you know, getting information, and it includes leadership and followership and all kinds of evaluation of things and people, <clears throat> we sent these gamers back into the games and said, go find examples of this stuff. And the, and the surprising finding is every single kind of work that, you can, that takes place in today's information economy is taking place in these games. And some of it is a lot of drudgery. Some of these games have gotten people to grind out uh, projects inside the games that require hours of very tedious, repetitive work. <clears throat> and so the question then is, how come people are paying Blizzard Entertainment $15 a month to do the same kind of work that over here I have to pay them to do at my company? <laughs> All right? That really is the fundamental question. What is it about the, the set of ingredients, the environment, the things that have been put together? You know, is it just because there's, you know, medieval themes and starships there? Or is it really a set of knowable, translatable, transportable ingredients that could change the level of engagement and satisfaction that we give workers? Now, let me just pause for a minute and introduce you to Vinny. Gliding into his sling-backed game chase, Vinny can't believe that only three months ago he used to sit in the Grand Central Station video surveillance office trying to keep track of a dozen cameras with nothing more than a walkie-talkie and a phone to summon response. So his eyes have glazed over long before his first coffee break. It's, break. it's hard to imagine a job more boring in, uh, than video surveillance. Some jobs are too easy to do well. And I don't know what Vinny's educational attainment is, but there, there isn't any level where, where, you know, where uh, someone can be expected to provide this level of focus. Well, um, at range finders, Vinny's job is going to be different. You know, if we can paint the yellow line on the football field without getting it on the back of the football players, we can insert at least in one more generation of, of computation. By the way, that isn't that easy a task, but um, we, we, we either now or very soon are going to be able to insert video bad guys right into the crowd that turns Vi Vinny's impossibly boring game into a fast action twitch first person shooter game where he is called upon to make choices about good guys and bad guys at a rate that keeps him engaged. We're going to have to worry about carpal tunnel syndrome and stress for Vinny, not about boredom and, and, um, and bed sores. You know, we can change this game. And, and what's interesting about what, uh, what th these tools allow you to do is we could change the error ratio to match the objective function of the owner of the task. So it's very, very expensive to miss a bad guy, but it's not free to do a false positive call and say that guy looks bad because it means boots uh, on the floor, time spent, a train delayed, a flight delayed, and whatever. So getting that ratio is something that um, uh, we just don't have the tools to try and drive towards that. Games are an example of giving us a tool where we could optimize the human computer interface to move closer to what the real objective function is for the task. But if you want to picture Vinny sitting there in his chair being driven uh, to carpal tunnel syndrome and stress, <clears throat> it raises the question, isn't this stuff kind of dangerous? As a biotechnology entrepreneur, I have to tell you, I've always been attracted to technologies that were dangerous. Not because they were dangerous per se, but if they weren't powerful enough to be dangerous, they may not be powerful enough to do good. So anything that's really powerful, like fire or nuclear power or words, <laughs> can be misused and can be very, very dangerous. And we have to develop systems and approaches, and we have to think about how we use powerful things like that. So people could uh, dress their avatar funny or offend people with the way their avatar looks or behaves, uh, talking about being too close in the elevator. Um, having Vinny in an antisocial narrative, maybe it's okay to use violence 
in a work setting where violence, preventing violence is the whole point. But at some point, you have to, you have to ask the question of what are we doing to Vinny? Um, repetitive stress, we talked about mistakes that, uh, that alter reputations. This is a form of monitored work uh, that will need a lot of scrutiny about how we handle privacy and how we handle the way people, um, people's reputations are preserved. Persistent, transparent reputations are a wonderful part of great games, but uh, there's, um, there's work to be done to make it part of the everyday workplace. And then, of course, there's privacy stuff. So um, I'd like to just finish with uh, a, a question for companies, small and large, about whether you have a game strategy. So what would a game strategy be first? It's an approach to evaluating, uh, exploring, uh, and maybe deploying these powerful new management and collaboration tools that come from the world of games. And the reason you should care is because your employees are going to expect it more and more, but most importantly, because it works, because we have a shortage of engagement. And um, these games and these ideas properly introduced into the workplace represent an opportunity to make work much more satisfying, much more meaningful, and even more productive. So I'll stop and take a few questions. Thanks. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm now a groupie of your uh, work. I was telling people this morning about the gaming aspects to learning. Could you talk about that as far as we do training, coaching, consulting? And my next platform on my business is to add uh, a personal coach for sales teams, for example, just in time, and use gaming as the platform. These, these are powerful ideas for gaming, and people have explored many of these same ideas with edutainment and e-learning and stuff in schools, and, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, one has to ask yourself, uh, oneself, how, what's, why hasn't it even become more popular? The basic ideas have been there for a long time. Um, there may be kind of an invisible thumb holding that back. There are a lot of people with a vested interest today in how we do train and teach. Uh, but even more likely, I, I, th I think that the technology has kind of reached a watershed, maybe a tipping point where the tools are there that can make it go faster. But the vision I like best is that we no longer have this bright separation between fixing to make money for shareholders and making money for shareholders. Just as I described with Jennifer, you know, the, we don't want your resume. Just sit down and start playing. If you ever get to level four, you're an employee. Um, you don't go to school to play World of Warcraft, and you certainly don't go to school to play Farmville, although there are some cheats out there on the Internet, I heard. But um, so you know, more and more training and learning is going to be intrinsic. It's going to be related to a task. So we're going to have kids uh, inverting matrices and helping somebody out with their crops in, you know, in, in, uh, in Africa, and, and that's why they need to hurry up and figure out how to invert that matrix. So I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Another couple? Sir, for uh, Coach Energy, I want to say that I'm a, if not your second biggest fan, your first biggest fan. I completely agree. Our company is actually doing exactly that. It's the, probably, I definitely think it's the future. So uh, I'm also on Second Life and I have a farm account. So it really is the way. You can also sell that way, I, I think. I want to ask, ask about Second Life, me being on Second Life more for social. Uh, how are you using that for what you're doing? Companies are using Second Life for all kinds of things as ways of meeting their customers and mostly for exploration. It is a magnificent achievement, but I think we're going to see a, a, a number of new virtual worlds be developed, and, and many of them are already out there in, in, in trials that are more specialized for different uses. If the whole point is to engage with your customer, Second Life may not be the place to do that. There's a lot of really interesting sex going on in Second Life that you may not want connected to your brand. You don't have to go there. But you might have heard about it. I don't know. Um, the, um, um, the, the first guy that built we, we built an island in Second Life uh, in 2004 when Second Life only had 17,000 users. And I, I wanted to hire the very best guy to build our, our, our virtual conference room and all this stuff. And I asked him about his resume. And he said, well, you can go look me up under my other name. He was, he was the, uh, the, the, the purveyor of virtual... Um, sex organs for people that wanted to do things in Second Life that we don't usually talk about. So, so, there, so it, 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 it's, it's not all that wild and woolly. There's plenty of great stuff to see in Second Life, but there are companies that, that just want to have a separate place. There's a company uh, that our firm, Alloy Ventures, invested in called Teleplace that is specifically optimized for virtual collaboration, and they, they do a great job of allowing enterprise workers to share applications and, 
and it has many of the great features of Second Life. Uh, there are others out there as well. So that world is going to continue to happen. Do you have a game for the children to teach their parents how to use this? You know, it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful question. It's already happening, right? Parents who are involved with their kids' use of the Internet are learning about this stuff faster than we can talk about it. How about? Yes. So be, so be involved with your kids' use of the Internet is my suggestion. Have there been any simulation done people who go in second life may not be that happy in their first life? Uh, there's, there's a whole literature of that. You know, there are people who get married in Second Life and have uh, problems with their real-life marriages. and all, There's all, all sorts of uh, amazing things that are happening. Um, there's, an, there's a growing literature on that. But by and large, just to dispel one of the main myths, by and large, if you look at kids who are heavy users of video games, they, across a number of studies, are slightly better, more fit, slightly more social, and do slightly better in school. So it, there's not a black or white answer that this is, uh, you know, the one thing our book could do is it gives parents uh, some hope here for the kids that really do spend a lot of time in the game. So I'll stop at that point. Thanks. Thanks.